Arl, Arl, Oral, Arl. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to Taste Like Music. Jason, Joe, and Crams are here. It is week three of Jaskus, the month in which I take over and pick all of the artists that we cover on the channel. This week, uh, we've got The Stranglers on tap, 18 studio albums, a big discography, and uh, it's going to be, a, uh, I think, a wild ride. A lot, of, uh, a lot of albums, for one, plus a lot of variety in styles and a lot of variance in quality, so... This should be interesting. It was a bit of a roller coaster ride going through this discography. How much did you guys know going in? Any at all? I didn't even know uh, Golden Brown was originally a Strangler's tune. I knew Golden Brown and I knew uh, the debut and the Raven. Just randomly, I think I heard the song Duchess at some point, just randomly listening to Spotify or something. And I liked it. I listened to the Raven and Went back and listened to the debut and uh, never listened to anything else. But I was, you know, I, I liked what I had heard. I just ne- well, never delved into them further. It's been a lot of new stuff for us lately. A lot of discoveries. Yeah, so I, I didn't know that much of the Stranglers either. Um, I'm kind of using the month to get into some things I've been wanting to dive into and haven't really had the chance with all the other stuff we've been listening to for the channel. They were a band that was kind of on my radar and I had heard a few songs here and there and people would mention them in the comments and I'd check things out. I don't know exactly what all I heard, but it seemed like every time I would check out a Stranglers tune, I'd be like, man, this is really cool. I should get into this band. Uh, So here we go. This was uh, the week that I did it. Um, If you don't know this channel, we cover a different artist every week. We rank all of the studio albums. We also make a separate video with our top 10 favorite songs and have a third discussion video as well. If that's the kind of content you're into, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe. And there's a lot to get to, so let's dive into it. We're going to do four at a time until we get to our top 10s. Um, So who's going to kick it off? Who wants to start? I guess I will. Um... And, yeah, my first album, I've only got two stars, but my favorite album is going to be up to four stars, so pretty big, wide variety over this scape here. But I've got the one from 2021, Dark Matters, at number 18, two stars. It's kind of big and overdone. I hate the song Water. The gothic notes don't really do it for me. I think the band at their worst is really messy and cluttered and bringing in too many of those styles. Like they have so many influences and styles and things they want to do. And they're better when they simplify things the way he does the, I miss you and something's got to kill me. It uh, might as well be love. It's so goofy at times they are really goofy in their later years. And I don't like it. No man's land is awful. Just bland stuff like down over the top, like white stallion. My number 17 is sweet 16. Goofiness again, kind of all around me. I'm still two stars, nothing too memorable and kind of that tongue in cheek, like pub rock that they double down on that I don't really like. An ongoing thing here is going to be some of the pub rock influences I don't care for and a lot of uses of organ where I'm like, why is there organ in this song? It's going to be kind of a repeat of the Stevie Wonder in that vein. But yeah, too much jolly organ, kind of annoying earworm hooks and she's slipping away and he does that big laugh. Just don't really like that style or posture. It's kind of clowny to me. It's kind of annoying. A little bit of buffoonery. I don't like it. I'm touchy with that stuff. Bless You is probably my favorite song in that album. Number 16, I've got Coup de Gras. I'm up to two and a half stars here. Uh, You got Jean-Jacques singing a good bit here. Kind of goofy at times again and seemingly all over the place a little bit on this album. Like the lead off track is kind of trancy techno. Don't really know why. And then I do like the lyrics on Tonight, but I don't think a lot of the synth sounds fit here. And Again, not very memorable. And then at number 15, I've got Giants at 2.5, an album which I think Jason might like a lot. Uh, Good bass, good bass everywhere on this discography, especially at the beginning. The bass is just really taking over a lot. Um, Some cool guitar throughout Giants, mainstream kind of sound a little bit while also doing a bit of throwback. But I do think it's way too sleek. And I think it's one of these albums, um, you know, the big reason is the production doesn't match the songs, I don't think. 
there are cool aspects of it. Like some of the songs have pretty cool composition, like when it picks up during Freedom is Insane. But like the title track, that style is just never going to blow me away. I like more highly emotional kind of stuff or stuff that's really creative and, you know, gripping or something really raw. This is kind of, you know, methodically tongue in cheek. And otherwise, the effects of that diminish for me. So I don't dislike it, but it's not for me. And thus, I won't revisit it. Two and a half stars for Giants. Those are my last four. I'll go next. Uh, Surprise. I, I thought you'd like things less. So the fact that you're 2.5, which you're a, I mean, your grades are a little uh, different than mine. So 2.5 isn't like horrible for you. So I'm, it's good. It's, it's a good start. Um Bottom for me, number 18, and I've heard some people talk glowingly about this album. I hate it. I can't stand a minute of it. The Gospel According to the Men in Black. Yes, I know. Uh, I guess this is their like trans or secret life of plants or, you know, sort of just out of left field. They were on a lot of heroin when they wrote this album, and it shows, at least to me, uh, I remember... I didn't even know this was an album. I was looking to the Raven. I was like, oh, this song, Men in Black, this is this is terrible. I'm glad I never have to listen to anything like this again. Better look at the title of the next album. And then it was the gospel according to Men in Black. So that was kicking the pants for me. Not uh, just, I, it's too weird. I don't like the alien voices. Just uh, hate it. Uh, 1.5 stars. Number 17, Coup de Gras. This one just sounds like a Pro Tools album. It's from 1998, so that makes sense. Uh, the the synths, the guitar sounds, it just sounds really wussy and soft. Everything's neutered. Even the drums and the bass are boring. And there's just, I didn't hear any songs that I liked at all. Two stars, very low, four out of 10 rating for me. Uh, 16, I got written in red, kind of like Valley of the Birds. Uh, this is with their second singer. And he kind of has like this Nick Kershaw meets Roland Orzabal vocals on this one. It's very poppy. It's very light. And I like the tone. I like the sound of the keys and the bass and the guitar is fine and everything. But uh, the songs are just way too soft and bland. Something like In Heaven She Walks is just so safe and boring and most of the album is like that uh 2.5 stars because at least it sounds decent i think it's well performed and the band is just really good so even on albums where i don't think the songwriting is top notch usually sounds pretty darn good uh number 15 i have sweet 16 uh i don't like the vocals much at all on this and sometimes I like Jean-Jacques Brunel's vocals. Sometimes they're not great. And uh, on this one, I don't know, they're they're like trying to get back to that pub rock, sort of the crude, rude, racy, raunchy sounds of like No More Heroes and, you know, the debut. But it just sounds too forced and uh, just not not great songwriting, to be honest. All right. Well... Got a bit of a Depeche Mode situation on our hands here. Is that giving up too much away for the longtime viewers of the channel? Um, I cannot believe neither of you had this in your bottom four. I think it is absolutely awful. My number 18 is 10 from 1990. Roy Thomas Baker's production. Sounds big, but it's bad early 90s big. It's cold. It's calculated sounding. It's muddy and soaked in reverb it's clangy it's just really awful sounding the drums are terrible i assume they're largely programmed they're absolutely devoid of any type of feel the wikipedia on this record says that 96 tears is a highlight but it's a completely pointless cover it doesn't do anything new uh apparently it was roy thomas baker's idea but it's such an obvious choice and so uninspired um, they have another song on the record called Too Many Teardrops. I imagine they played that and he was like, you know what you should do? You should cover 96 Tears. 
it's just it's just stupid some of these okay songs might be okay with different production but i think this record just sounds like a mess i can't believe it's roy thomas baker it sounds so god awful um it sounds like he forgot to take a break and just like what kept turning it up and turning it up to the point where like he was just being assaulted with sound and didn't know what he was hearing anymore he like needed to step away from the mix i think and you know go get a cup of coffee or something and come back and listen with fresh ears but it just sounds like total trash i think it's a horrible sounding record 1.5 stars for 10 my number 17 is going to be norfolk coast this was their first album in six years the title track starts out with some heavy bass some heavily distorted guitars it's the first record with their uh, new guitarist baz warren uh there's definitely a renewal of enthusiasm and and some energy here it's rocking a little harder than they had been the mixes are a little more in your face which is all good i think it was sorely needed but i think beyond just adding some volume and intensity here i'm not sure really how much better it is the songs aren't very memorable the production is kind of flat and dull sounding some of the guitar tones are kind of crap um especially on lost control it was heralded as a big return to form, but I think people were just kind of tricked by it being really loud. And actually, I think it's one of their weakest sets of material that they ever came up with. So I've got that at two stars. Number 16 is Sweet 16. Paul Roberts uh, wasn't invited to the recording sessions for this, and I guess he got real bent out of shape about it um, and ended up leaving the band. So all the vocals are done by um, Baz and Jean-Jacques and... I don't know. I think it's only slightly better than Nor Norfolk Coast was in that it's a bit more melodic and a bit more tuneful. It has almost like a little pop punk influence in it, it sounds like. But I don't know. Most of it still sounds like either completely anonymous or just like a shadow of the, their former selves. There's a few weird moments on it, too, like um, Sumat out and out, which sounds like a weird Let Me Kill Mr. impression. And I Hate You is kind of like this weird country thing. So I don't know. I don't think that one's too great. My number 15 is going to be Coup de Gras. They worked with David M. Allen on this record, uh, who produced Cure and Sisters of Mercy and Depeche Mode and Chameleons and Human League. He's got a real nice resume. Plus, Jean-Jacques wrestles uh, some control of the band back after not having much for the previous few records. All of that should be a good thing. Um, sadly, it doesn't work out that way. Uh, God is Good is just a weird, dark, Depeche Mode sounding electronic textures and stuff. But it's just an awful song with the weird chanting and the God is Good over and over. It's just, I think, the worst song in their catalog, probably. Just horribly annoying. Uh, just a really bad way to open the record. And it doesn't improve much from there for song like song wise i don't know it's kind of like instead of the generic 90s rock that they were doing before this they just kind of fumble their way through a bad attempt at recapturing the 80s got some really small drum sounds weird mixing decisions all over it they remake the track miss you from a previous record which is uh pointless you don't think what you've done is wrong is kind of all right sung by burnell that's maybe the one bright spot but there's not a lot here that i find worthwhile so this is two and a half stars all right. Number 14 for me, I've got About Time, 2.5. Bit of a grittier and meatier guitar tone. Golden Boy is a decent little opener. Money is decent. They succeed a little bit on this album because they simplify things. That's going to be a common denominator in my reviews. Again, I often just think they put too much stuff into their songs, especially during this era. It really just hurts the emotional communication. Face is kind of cool. I like how he's singing it. Sinister is awesome. I like Sinister a good bit. Um, and I think of the newer kind of albums, this one probably has some of the better guitar work. I think the vocals probably sound the best, but just not the best songs. Paradise Row is kind of cool. There's a cool slyness to the record, but still nothing I'll revisit. Number 13, I've got written in red. I'm pretty much with Joe here. But there are still some pretty cool bass lines and a pretty cool 80s sparkly rock sound. I do like In Heaven She Walks a good bit. I think it's a bit of a fun festive album drawing from like In Excess and stuff like that. Uh, but a lot of it's just kind of boring and thin, like through the blue, like blue sky. Daddy's riding the range is really weird and bad. Number 12, we've got Norfolk Coast. And I'm kind of surprised that so many people that I've read online were like into this album. I think it's kind of what people think is like a bit of their return to form. But I think it's just a bit generic, although it's energetic and cool. The title track's cool. You get that musy synth part in the background. Feels a lot of it's just kind of basic, though, um, which in a way is not a bad thing because I like I said, it's like when they're simpler, 
but you know, it just doesn't have a lot of stuff going. Not a lot of hooks. Um, the synths kind of take a weird role when they're not driving anything. They're just kind of doing these really robust hooks in the background that like kind of overtake and ruin like everything they have going in the songs. And then number 11, I've got Oral Sculpture. Reminds me a bit of like sophisticated pop kind of Roxy music stuff. Ice Queen is kind of a cool song, but it's a terrible opener. They're not good at picking openers. I will say that. Um, it takes a while for me to get gripped by their albums, except for like the first few albums. And the sounds here do not fit like with the goofy nature of the songs. I don't know. Everything kind of seems a little bit off on this, but I do kind of like some of the songs. Uh, Let Me Down Easy, No Mercy, Uptown is this really cool punchy guitar part. Um, laughing is kind of cool, but it's a little bit thin. The songs don't quite come together, though it's close. So that's just out of my top 10, still a 2.5. Interesting. Uh, surprised this one hasn't popped up yet. My number 14 is going to be Feline from 83. Comes after Folly. Uh, you guys are acting like I'm crazy over here. It's generally regarded as like one of the worst ones. So don't know what you guys are thinking or talking about. Save your glances and whatever, please. Uh, this one just, I don't know, it's like the debauchery and the raucousness has been replaced with like these crooning attempts to recreate golden brown i'm assuming is what the label was like just keep doing golden brown but i don't know it leans too much into the 80s sound uh and i like the way that uh greenfield adapts his synth sounds for every era like he's just so awesome i love every second of his playing everything he does i think is pretty awesome but i think the songs are just too soft too weak there's no grit there's no grime and it's just not good enough 80s tunes so uh three stars I don't, I don't think it's bad but just sort of anonymous number 13 i got norfolk coast and i was surprised at this one you guys didn't like it as much but i didn't think they had this in them after something like written in red where it's just uh, but i think this is a pretty fun record i think again greenfield's keys fantastic bubbling and burbling shimmering on big thing coming paul roberts definitely like i get some in excess i get like a lot of billy idol like he's he's doing like this croon growl thing but it but it kind of works i, I kind of like what he does um and uh this one's a lot more upbeat harkens back to the 70s sound with like you know 2000s polish on it but I think it's pretty solid. I think Baz Warren injects some life into the band with his guitar sound and his playing. I think it starts off pretty strong, kind of loses it towards the end, but I think it's pretty decent. 3.5 stars. Uh, number 12, one that Jason hates, it was his 18th, but I think is fine. Everyone was saying how bad this one is, but I thought it was totally just pretty much like all the others. Everyone keeps talking about, and Jason brought it up like, ups and downs like i'm at 3.5 stars it's gonna be a lot of 3.5 stars like for a long time at this point like it, i just thought all of these were good i don't know if they like super stood out and there's always sort of like problems where the band like loses it and the second half of these albums kind of tail off for me but i thought most of these albums are pretty good so i have 10 at 12 3.5 stars i like sweet smell of success uh, it's got that fun bass line, that jazzy piano break, there's horns, it sounds like madness, uh, a little bit like almost like early British ska, which is probably why Jason hates it so much. Someone like you has like pub rock horns, little in excess meets Elvis Costello. 96 Tears, it's fine. I like it. I like the songs and I think they do a fine job. Uh, and this place has cool, haunting, baroque choral vocals in it. And I mean, I didn't think the production was bad at all. I, don't, I thought it sounded fine for 1990. I don't know. Uh, I thought the album was much better than this reputation. And finally at 11, I have Dreamtime, another of their smooth 80s pop. Uh, this one has programmed drums. There's lots of like backing vocals on tracks, like Always the Sun. I hear a lot of like the cars, like they're trying to do um, 
like the cars like the backing vocals straight out of the cars you know very heartbeat city like but there's also some like um talk vocals it reminds me of like pulp a little bit in there some cool stuff you'll always reap what you sow has some nice lap steel nice niche has i don't know it has like a pixies vibe a little bit thanks to jean jacques brunel's brunel's whispery vocals but then has like this big 80s cars production it's pretty decent but these like mid 80s albums for me i, I just miss some of that like mischievousness of the uh late 70s early 80s it's a little too smooth uh for me to really like but i, I think it's pretty solid uh you know, they did the 80s synth pop revolution pretty decently. All right. Uh, my number 14 is Stranglers in the Night. Uh, you got uh, Mike Kemp back who produced Dreamtime. At least it has a much better sound than the previous record 10 did. Uh, they introduced two new members after Cornwell's departure, Paul Roberts and John Ellis. Uh, it was an attempt at a less produced sound. And I mean, you have to figure that just about anything would have been. Um, Time to Die is a kind of a cool, uh, cool noirish opener. Sugar Bullets is a pretty decent tune, far better than anything on 10, I think. Heaven and Hell is pretty all right. Still, though, I think the band seems to kind of have lost their soul around this time. Everything here is fairly generic. And even though they've like turned down the reverb and gotten rid of the horns, it still feels a little overproduced. I will say Grand Canyon is pretty cool. Different sort of track for them with the big tribal drums. I don't know. It's only 12 tracks, but it feels too long. It's kind of uninteresting, 52 minutes. So uh, only staying at 2.5 for that one. Uh, my number 13 is going to be written in red from 1997. Uh, Andy Gill from Gang of Four produced this one or co-produced it at least. Uh, the first record of theirs to miss the top 40 in the UK Right out of the gate with uh, Valley of the Birds, you have a little more of the classic Stranglers sound, I think, with that pretty cool organ riff. Uh, the album's lone single and Heaven She Walks, I think, is an okay pop single, pretty catchy. He gives like an almost Bono-esque vocal performance in the chorus with those big soaring like backing OOs that he's doing. It still probably doesn't go far enough to bring more personality back to the band. Uh, Jean-Jacques Brunel has said that um, he had basically given up at this point on the band and had like very little control of what was happening. He said it was basically just uh, John, Paul, and you know some guy operating the Pro Tools rig. So uh, just the new guys basically taking things over. And I think the criticisms of this band during this era are all pretty valid, but it's still not terrible. There are some pretty good songs. Most of the performances are good. I think it's an enjoyable listen when it's on, but when it's over, it just kind of evaporates. And I don't think I will remember a bit of it. So 2.5 there still. Then we're going to go to their final record, Dark Matters, uh, released after the death of keyboardist David Greenfield. Also the first album without Jet Black. Uh, Greenfield, the keyboardist, is on eight of the 11 tracks. Uh, this one went to number four on the charts in the UK, their highest since Feline. I think it's still pretty good sounding after Giants, but I, I don't think it sounds as inspired as that record. And If You Should See Dave is a touching tribute to Greenfield, but I think most of the songwriting is not as strong as that. Um, not much of it stands out. And to me, the vocals aren't really very captivating. The, the Warren Burnell combo kind of worked on Giants but here I think not working so well and in general when it was just the two of them I think they could have used like a true lead singer most of the time this record kind of reverts back to their their more anonymous ways of previous records my number 11 is About Time from 1995 uh, not sure how we got from Radis Norvegicus to here uh, with an album cover that looks like a bad Queensryche album from the 90s and you got this new singer, Paul Roberts, basically doing like an Ian Astbury impression on this record throughout. Um, I don't know. 90 Stranglers has very little in common with the uh, Hugh Cornwell era of the band. It seems like a totally different band entirely, except for the fact that there's some faint organ in the background at times. All that said, I think it's pretty decent rock music. I think Money would be a, a cool song for the cult to have done. So when you're comparing it to like what you want from the Stranglers, it might not be a great record. If you compare it to the other bands that they're kind of sounding like around this time, I, th I think it stands up decently well. Face is a good melodic tune, has a cool guitar part, and it has that really great electric violin solo in it. Um, 
And I think how you feel about this album will like greatly depend on the lens that you're viewing it through. Like I said, I think it's got some pretty good songs. I think it's a decent sounding record. Um, it features the only song solely written by Jet Black, the drummer. It was also the album's only single. A super bizarre choice of single. It's one of the weaker songs on the record. Um, in addition to being fairly poor at choosing opening tracks for their records, like Cram said, I think they're also really bad at choosing singles. Some of their singles that they released are real head scratchers, but this one's not too bad of a record. I've got it up at three stars. All right. Top 10 favorite Stranglers albums. My number 10 is Stranglers in the Night. Stranglers in the Night. 2.5. Bit of a more misty, pretty kind of sound here, a sheen to it. But like Jason said, a little bit less production, less cluttered, which I like. Great album cover, too. Also, um, Pretty cool. They got some cool album covers. This and Feline, I really like. Time to Die, like Jason said, is really cool and cinematic. I get like some Nick Cave vibes on it, which is pretty cool. Sugar Bullets, I like a lot. I really, at, at first time I heard it, I was like, I don't know about these lyrics. And then I was like, oh, no, wait, they are pretty cool. I do like Heaven or Hell, but I'm not crazy about the chorus. Uh, though I do love a good thin sounding arpeggio. And this song has a beautiful big solo on it. Laughing at the Rain is pretty cool. Yeah, you know, like they're going for like, you know, like kind of Tears for Fears, Echo and the Bunnymen kind of, you know, heavenly kind of simple pop music here, which is cool. Again, the simpler, the better. Uh, but I think it kind of falls flat with everything we're going for. It's not quite lush enough. Songs don't really hook you enough. Like Brain Box, kind of boring. Although I think Southern Mountains has some really cool instrumentation pieces. Uh, but Gain Entry to Your Soul is quite lame. Um, that's one of the just lamer things I've ever said aloud. Gain Entry to Your Soul. And I don't like Grand Canyon at all. Uh, I think Jason said he liked it a lot. I, I don't see it. But I think the weird kind of twisty wet afternoon is cool. And, you know, you get kind of like those nerdy sci-fi Thomas Dolby kind of effects uh, throughout this era a little bit. Um, so I still only have it at 2.5, but getting close here. It's my last 2.5. Only good albums from here on. Rainy, my 10 is going to be Dark Matters, the most recent one. Um, Dave Greenfield died in 2020, so they completed it without him but it still features his great playing right till the end. Love you, Dave. He was the killer um, part of this week for me. I much loved everything he did. Uh, drummer Jet Black quit. So it's pretty much just the Jean-Jacques Burnell show along with Baz Warren, um, who had been the, with the band for a while, but I think they get back to the classic Strangler sound pretty, pretty well. I mean, they kind of had gone back there with Giants, but... Uh, this continues it. Uh, water sounds, you know, a little ragged, but it sounds like classic Stranglers. The bass is booming. That's a nice guitar from Warren and uh, great keys, of course. And I, I like Warren's vocals, I think, more than Jean Jacques. Is a little more of that bratty, punky vocal style, which works well with the band. And if you should see Dave, very touching, heartfelt. The instrumentation throughout this. Uh, album is very good. Payday, live little rocker, good melody. Down, I think steals the melody from Hello by Lionel Richie a little bit, but uh, soft and tender. I think it works pretty well. And I really like The Last Men on the Moon. Ambitious, progressive, uh, multiple parts, really cool spacey synth and some impressive playing on it. I like when they you know do those like longer, more epic tunes. And White Stallion's pretty sweet. Uh, some dancey vibes, great bass, huge bass, just massive bass. Uh, cool keys as well. So I think it's a solid album, 3.5 stars. I think the, the Stranglers did a pretty good job of navigating throughout each decade, kind of taking sounds from each one, but for the most part, maintaining their DNA. And this one sounds like a, you know, a 2020 album, but you can still hear the Stranglers in them. So uh, pretty good job of the band for getting through all these years intact. The good sound. All right. My number 10 is going to be Dream Time from 1986. Not a bad record, but I, I kind of see it as kind of the beginning of their downturn. Their lowest charting album of the Cornwell years. And I think if, if Oral Sculpture was like their Let's Dance, this is like their Tonight. In that I feel like 
they were kind of legitimately interested in playing with pop sounds on oral sculpture. And then that kind of worked. And then they were like, felt maybe locked into it. They feel kind of almost restricted by having to do another poppy record almost on this one. It has good moments, but I don't know, a, a little bit more anonymous 80s pop than great 80s pop doesn't have that clear personality and vision that oral sculpture had. They started working with Laurie Latham again on this record, but he said the uh, songs needed more work, so they cut them loose. I don't know, maybe Latham was right, though. Even though it sounds good and the songs like feel like pop hits, nothing really sticks here. Um, Always the Sun, I think, is probably the best track. Even the other singles don't offer much. Uh, some of the sounds used on Big in America are just awful just like these really big wonky synth sounds. I don't know. This is kind of where they started to lose sight of themselves a little, I think, even though it's, you know, it's decent sounding and there's some nice melodies and stuff. And like Joe mentioned, the production, the backing vocals and stuff, it's got a nice sheen to it. I just don't think the songs are that great. So I've got it at three stars. All right. I'm also talking about Dreamtime, my number nine, and I'm up to three stars, which means it's good. Always the sun, awesome, more of the beautiful 80s dream pop, kind of like Thompson Twins kind of style, especially in the keyboard. I really dig. I like the title track quite a bit. Vibraphone solo is pretty cool. Great chorus with a little guitar part that fits just perfect. Nice little guitar accent there. Just going for 80s pop here, and I think it works pretty well. I don't think they're restrained here. I think it lets the songwriting kind of uh, be the main focus a little bit. The rhythm section is kind of calm and collected. Pretty, pretty cool a lot of the time. Was It You is a lot of fun. It's just like fun, big 80s pop, a la the big acts of the time. Like this is kind of like their songs from the big chair almost. Like the anthemic production of You Always Reap What You Sow. Really like it. Very heavenly stuff. Ghost Train, though, kind of falls flat. There's very few albums up until my peak albums that like, I don't think there's like a dud on there and like strong duds like Ghost Train. I do not like at all, um, but I think Nice and Nice is a bit perkier and quite fun. Nice little jolt for the album. You know, and I think because it's kind of more of like a cookie cutter 80s pop album, it works. Again, less is more with this band to me for the most part. Uh, Big in America has a pretty cool beat. Some questionable synth sounds. Um, Shaking Like a Leaf doesn't really do it for me. And Mayan Skies is kind of cool, very picturesque. And like even with those kind of synth sounds that don't do it for me and they sound very dated and kind of weird there's still kind of like a charming nostalgia to them like those early sounds so it's kind of cool and then two precious is a pretty cool closer just a pretty easy going easy to like pop album with you know 80s touches so that's my number nine dream time and my first three star rating which means it's good means it's good all right here's a good album I got Giants is my number nine. And this was their first after the not so good um, Sweet 16. This one comes like, what, six years later. So I think it's a, a good step back towards their original sound. They kind of got rid of all the, the non-strangler parts of the band. So they're, they're kind of getting back to their roots here. And I think it's just a solid all the way through this might be their most consistent album outside maybe their glory years um, but i think it's just solid track after solid track freedom is insane pretty good love the bass sounds super punchy giants has that kind of pulpy talk singing or maybe pulp stole it from them I don't, i'm not sure where who stole what from what but i do get a little uh, like jarvis cocker sometimes from baz warren um lowlands has some cool arpeggios in the synth playing uh another great bass track from jean jacques i think his, his bass sound is just fantastic throughout the catalog and uh whatever they kind of went away from it a little bit too much in the 90s but back with this and on dark matter it's just that like super low end just like mm bowel like shaking bass uh sound is back it's fantastic boom boom sounds a lot like classic stranglers my fickle resolve shows them like trying you know trying some new stuff branching out got some jazzy introspective notes mercury rising is a weird one some like strange synths and weird rhythms and singing 
Um, but uh, really cool, interesting, unique. They do some Spanish on Adios Tango. Um, Warren gets to let loose a little bit with some slick metal riffs and solo stuff. Uh, 15 Steps, cool, punky, driving rocker. Great synth sound from Greenfield on that, which I love. And uh, I just think it's a very solid, I mean, it doesn't blow me away. Maybe I need a couple more listens because uh, it, you know, late in, late in these uh, discographies, I usually don't get to those uh, as much. But uh, I think Giants is a very solid late period album from uh, The Strangers. Three and a half stars. Though. All right. My number nine is also Giants. I think it's their best sounding album in ages, probably since Aural Sculpture. Opens with an instrumental with great bass and organ, probably their closest approximation of their own sound in a long time. Freedom is insane, has a great driving rhythm, great melodic guitar line. The guitar on the title track is also great. The guitar all over this album sounds really good. It's like they finally realized that it's not only the organ and keys that make their sound what it was. Lowlands is great. I love that it takes its time to develop before introducing the vocals um kind of taking a cue from the cure there time was once on my side i think is a really catchy tune there's killer bass on mercury rising which brings back some of that delightful weirdness from the early days of the band which was sorely missing through the 90s and the early part of the 2000s um and almost exactly like joe said it's not amazing but it's really good and honestly just like a a, a good record and i i think they were I didn't think they were capable of making a record this good anymore. After so much mediocrity, it was good to, to see them kind of break through and, and come up with something this good. Uh, so I'm moving up here to 3.5. All right. My number eight is 10, and I have it at three stars. I don't know why people dislike it so much. Um, I don't mind the production. I'm with Joe. I like that kind of cool, weird, clanky weirdness. I actually really dig it and I love the drum sound and we've had this talk so much. I love that big gated reverb sound. It's kind of a properly silly, fun tongue in cheek album. Someone like you is really fun with that quirky organ lead. It's one of the only times I really like the organ in this catalog. And I generally like the mix on this. It's just not Jason's cup of tea. I don't think you can say it's bad. It's just not what he likes uh, because it's not boring. The 96 tears is cool. It makes sense, and it's a little uninspiring, but it's a good listen. Um, and this place darkens it up a little bit, but it doesn't depart too much. I think it's got good variety. It's got a good kind of rhythm to, you know, how the album the album feels pretty cool. Uh, the guitar on Let's Celebrate is wonderful, as well as Man on Earth. Songs are just kind of direct and catchy, and I love 80s pop, so I like it. And I really dig some of the vocal production, like too many teardrops has like this, you know, again, the Thompson twins kind of thing going on. And then, you know, out of nowhere, you get more of the punky pub rock vibes on uh, where I live, which I like. So they're like versions of things on other albums that I'm not crazy about, but for some reason in this weird cold eighties realm, it works for me. So yeah, I like the album feel here. I'm going three stars, number eight, 10, three, eight, 10. Mm-hmm. My number eight is going to be about time. And I, I was surprised at how much I like this one, although it's the same rating basically as Giants. These these albums, they're basically all the same. I couldn't, I just couldn't get like a handle on like where to put them. Like I would listen to them and they'd like move around. I don't think I've had as much movement in a discography ever uh besides this one but i like paul roberts's vocals and uh, he's not as interesting as hugh cornwell but he you know he's always shifting and changing and on this one he sounds kind of you know he's like between elvis jim morrison and i get like a bunch of mike Patton vibes on this one which is interesting mid 90s you can see that um i like the use of string quartet on a couple tracks i think little blue lives is a really cool song very poppy but this undercurrent of darkness which is cool really like the organ sound and roberts is doing like a a, an elvis kind of impression on this one but i I think it cool works uh paradise row very catchy more cool keys on it and i like lies and deception i don't know if it's a good single but it's a dark little waltz and has a really cool classical guitar solo on it 
And in general, and I don't know if anything's like super great on this album, but this reminds me of like a mellower Faith No More a little bit. So like if Mike Patton was like a normal dude, he might make an album kind of like this. And I think the playing is all very solid. So it's 3.5 stars. It's nothing mind blowing. It's not going to make my top 10 and 95 or anything at the height of you know alternative, but I think it's solid, fine album. All right, next up for me, this is where things get kind of tight, I think. Uh, their early stuff, their first eight albums or so. Maybe this will be a little too early on my list for some people, but my number eight, I'm going black and white from 1978. Uh, this one is divided into two halves, a white side, which was side one, and a black side, which was side two. This is their third record, and I don't think it opens as strong as the previous two records. I think the uh, opening track on each of their uh, first two are just like classic tunes, so good. And this one opens with Tank, which I don't think is that great. And then you've got all these exploding tank sounds, and it's really distracting. Nice and sleazy, though. Pretty cool tune. Great bass work. Great bass tone. Reminds me kind of like something The Clash would do several years later on London Calling. I don't know exactly what track it's reminding me of. Maybe I'm not down, but kind of Clash-esque. Um, I think on the debut, maybe they leaned, uh, well, they definitely leaned heavily on Dave Greenfield. I, I don't know if I'd say too much or not, but a lot of Dave Greenfield going on. And I think on this record, they're becoming a little more groove-centric, a little bit more um, drum and bass doing the heavy lifting with Greenfield kind of just like filling in the gaps between them. That said, there's still plenty of moments where Greenfield's very prominent, like on Sweden, which has very cool electric piano on that one. Um, the bass on Toiler on the Sea is completely gnarly, with just a wicked tone on that from Jean-Jacques. Really cool stuff. Um, like No More Heroes, I think it, it plays a little long. It, I think it feels longer than it actually is. I love the general direction of this record. I like the sound of it. I like the energy. But even like the three and four minute songs seem a little long, like the, they start at 10 and then have nowhere to go from there. And they kind of run their course by the two and a half minute mark, but then you got to sit through another minute of it. And I think that happens on a lot of the tracks on this record. And aside from Nice and Sleazy, I don't think there's really like another knockout track on this one. So I think it's a good record. I just don't think it stacks up to their best stuff. So three and a half for me. I pretty much agree. It's my number seven. I think they're a little bit out of their creative ideas and kind of that post-punk meets new wave kind of realm in the first two albums. But they're still good, like post-punk tunes, just not great. A little bit uninventive. You know, I'm not sure how much of the stuff on this album kind of sets them apart among their peers, except for the bass, because the bass rules. And I agree. I'm not crazy about Tank as an opener, but I do love Nice and Sweezy. That bass is so fat, so cool. And, you know, it's got like classic kind of angular, edgy knifing guitars, and he's got like that muscular singing over it. Outside Tokyo is kind of cool. Hey, Rise of the Robots is, you know, funky and fun. Sweden's cool. It sounds good, but it's a little bit by the numbers. Um, you know, if you made a greatest hits just from like the first three albums, I don't think a lot of the songs on here would you know, outperform the first two. Um, and The Shadows is one of my favorites on it you know, I'm pretty much with Jason on everything. So they just have more in them than, you know, just good by the numbers kind of songs, but it's still a good listen. No doubt. There's not really anything to complain about. It just doesn't blow you away. Hard disagree. My number seven is Arl Sculpture from 1984. Absolutely love Ice Queen. The synth sounds they get out of this track are just incredible. I love how icy they are. Uh, it's almost I don't know, like Van Halen-esque, 1984 style, like that, that really specific uh, keyboard synth uh, sound. Get a little of that, I don't know, Naked Eyes, a little of that new romantic sound in here. Uh, but unfortunately, it's a bit of a unicorn. The rest of the album is good, skin deep, a lot brighter, a lot poppier. There's horns all over the place. Uh, no Mercy sounds a little bit like an ABC track. Um, the Da 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 riff, very 80 sounding, booming bass, squelching horns. It's fine. Uh, North winds, uh, a little darker, but still, it, it has like that a little bit more brightness than we're accustomed to for the band. Uh, uptown, big acoustic guitar, good hook. 
Punch and Judy's got plenty of horns in it. Spain's a good track. But I don't know. After Ice Queen, I wanted more of that darkness, that sort of like icy, you know, icy frozen, cold wind blowing through. You just don't quite get it. It's a little too bright, a little too 80s for me. So I like it. Uh, it's good 3.5 star album. And there's no, you know, there's no weak points. It's another one that's pretty good all the way through, but nothing quite as good as Ice Queen. And that sort of hurts it for me. All right. My number seven is going to be The Raven from 1979. I feel like this one's kind of the beginning of their evolution away from the early punk sounding records, uh, especially Greenfield with his choice of uh, keyboard sounds evolving a little bit away from the electric piano and so much organ. You're getting like some 8-bit computer game synth on a track like Ice, a uh, nuclear device. Sounds even more evolved into like a 90s arcade game. Lyrically stretching a little bit too on this record. You got tracks like Shasha A Go Go, Dead Los Angeles, Nuclear Device. I think they're going beyond just writing about themselves a little. It's not just like, I want to drive around in a tank. It's songs are like a little bit more socially conscious than that. And I think the changes are welcome. And like I said, I still like black and white but I don't know how long they could have continued just like making that record over over and over again. So I think they did need to evolve. Um, but at the same time, to be clear, I also don't think The Raven is a radical departure, but I think it's the beginning of like a long evolution that they went through with introducing new sounds. Um, the pitched vocals on Men in Black, I mean, I think that's super cool. That's the kind of weirdness I welcome. Um, it closes with Genetics with Greenfield singing lead, which is a really strange track with some really odd parts. Um, the drum part is really weird. The keys are weird. The guitar is doing like this really unconventional line. I don't think it's a great song, but I appreciate the effort of like all these like new ideas that they're coming up with. For me, the highlight of the record is Duchess, which has a really great drum part. Uh, it's really tuneful, um, was the lead single, went to number 14 in the UK. I think it's a really, really good tune. Uh, cool keys on there as well. Uh, overall, a good record. I just think, you know, they've got stuff I like better on each end of the evolution. Like the early stuff I think is really awesome. And some of the stuff they would come up with after this, I like more as well, too. So number seven, The Raven, three and a half stars. My number six is No More Heroes. It's cruel, aggressive, violent. I got it at three stars. It's nasty at times, but still melodic. But I just prefer their kind of weirder stuff. I'm not going to lie. And again, what's the organ doing here? Who invited the organ? I don't like the little pub rock here at all. I know, I know, I know. Just it's me and organs. I'm not organic. The pub rock influences just work for me only in little amounts in certain scenarios. Bitching is really cool, though. And just the bass tone and the bass lines. So dope. And the bass lines are never like overwhelming. They're just like perfectly crafted to just give like a really interesting backbone to all the songs. So I really appreciate it for being noticeable, but not overwhelming. It's very cool dynamic. Dead Ringer is pretty awesome. No, Cromwell's just got a lot of poise here and it's so cool. There's really cool raw energy and tight playing here with cool new wave spunk with punk and the production's cool. Bring on the new bios has really cool vocal effects. And like, if this is your style of music, yeah, this is like a four and a half or five star album. It's just not quite my super wheelhouse. Something better change is cool. But again, like go away a little bit, Oregon. I don't, it's not, it's not fitting the vibe that I'm getting. Same with the title track. English Challenge is kind of pleasant and catchy and like awesomely British. And, you know, these are just cool little fireball songs, nice and tight. It makes for a good album list and three stars. That's, that's all I can say. That's how I'm saying it. All right. My number six might be a mistake. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. Strangers in the Night is my number six. And I don't know how it got all the way up here, but uh, it did. We got a new singer on this one. They bring in Paul Roberts who he channels all sorts of different people on this. I, I get a bunch of Tears for Fears. I get some Billy Idol. I get some Nick Kershaw. But I kind of like it. Um, 
these songs still have like a little bit of the 80s left in them but i think it's more guitar focused there's better riffs we move away from the 80s production it's a little more straightforward rock and roll but uh, i love the way it starts with time to die got that surf rock kind of evil surf rock vibe some spoken word interludes every now and again real cool uh, i think sugar bullets is catchy as heck and um, it, it feels like an in excess song to me um, less of like the cars and that 80s sound more you know a little harder rock and stuff uh, the bubbling keys from greenfield excellent there heaven or hell has this fun spooky vibe the great synth sound kind of morphs into just a good pop song um, it's you know it sounds like it could be from the 80s uh, structure and sort of sound wise but it has a, a more of a 90s production to it which is cool uh, so they're both like retro and current laughing the rain a good catchy rock number uh, the sprangy synth of what afternoon is cool got a fretless bass in there which is nice and I think Paul Roberts vocals are just really good uh, very dynamic and uh, I don't know I didn't write all that much about this album so maybe it just sort of got stuck here at six and then just like all the other ones are kind of fluctuating around it and there it is but I don't there's no bad songs on this album for me and we're still right in the middle of 3.5 stars so I don't know maybe it's just uh what the Stranglers are to me a, a solid band with a bunch of good tracks and great playing but I don't know nothing at least on most of the albums that like rises into stuff like I can't wait to listen to this again or you know I much prefer this one to this one they, they're all kind of blending together uh during the past couple of weeks of listening so who knows? I don't know. I don't. I don't get this roller coaster of uh, scores and stuff. I think they're they're all pretty good. All pretty much the same. All right. Well, I'm with Cram on my number six. I've got no more heroes. I do, however, love all the Dave Greenfield keyboard work on it. The first thing you notice putting this record on after the debut is a much fatter sound. Huge toms and the kick. They pack such a big fat punch. Got another great opening track. I love the energy of I Feel Like a Wog. Can I say Wog? I don't know if that's acceptable, but uh, I didn't know what a Wog was until recently when I looked it up and a uh, bit of a racial slur. Hopefully no one's offended, but it's a killer tune. Um, awesome vocal delivery by Cornwell on that one. Um, you've also got uh, Something Better Change, which is really cool. The title track is cool. Um, however, aside from like a handful of tracks and maybe a few others, I don't think the songs are as strong here as they are on the debut. And I think taken on their own tracks like Burning Up Time and English Towns are good. But when you take them all like in a lump together and especially after like immediately listening to the debut before this, I, I think some of this record starts to feel a little bit samey and they start to feel maybe like they're a one trick pony. Obviously, they're not. They go on to do all kinds of stuff. But at this point in the discography, uh, it's starting to feel a little repetitive, even though it's only their second record. It's only 38 minutes, but like I said about Black and White, it feels longer than that. It feels like it's maybe 50 minutes. I think it sounds better than the debut, and I still like the general direction of this record, but I think it just needs a little more variety and maybe some tempo changes, a little bit of a mix up here. A lot of these songs sound very similar to me. So while I think it's a very cool record, um, I think it's just a little too samey to be truly great, even though the, the opening track is so killer. 3.5 stars. All right. My number five is Feline. Three stars. Killer album art. Love it. Really cool new sound, though I don't think it's quite perfected. I love just like the cool, cold synth, the lively bass, the jangly guitar. It's a small world is cool. I like how small the sound is here. It's very intimate, embracing like the baby steps of like this new wave, British new wave with like early Depeche mode and stuff like that. And the bass is doing a lot of heavy lifting here, which is totally fine. There's just something so charming about like this early 80s sound that I really dig. European female is really cool. Bass on that one's great. Great bass lines. Really cool guitar work on that track too. 
kind of an oddly sexy record with just like some iciness and some bizarre strange quirks and like confidence behind it i just really dig the vibe on it it's like a regal poetry to it like on let's tango in paris album definitely feels like a building block to like other things as a lot of like the style seems a bit unfinished or unflushed but paradise is kind of quirky and clanky also has like this cool worldly feel to it like this weird map of like femininity and like you're either in paradise or france or small world and all this stuff you get blue sister kind of spunky never say goodbye good closer it's really like this thin you know mysterious icy nature to it and that panther on the cover is just like the perfect kind of feel for it i dig it sometimes an album cover makes the album for you but i do genuinely like listening to this song. and i think jason does too three stars for feline it's pretty cool, Joe. You are nuts. Both of you are nuts, and the album cover stinks. That's janky. That's one of the worst felines I've ever seen. It sucks. Terrible. My number five is going to be La Folie uh, from 1981. This is when they go new wave, I think. Um, it still has you know, remnants of the old Strangler sound. There's some pub rock in there. There's a little bit of punk left. Were they ever punk? I don't even know. I guess they were on No More Heroes, but they, they fluctuate so much that they're really hard to like pin down into one single uh, genre. But this one's you know probably their most new wave sounding. Uh, Everybody Loves You When You're Dead has you know some new wave. It has a little bit of that baroqueness of The Raven that they did so well on that one. Nonstop, the album opener, very new wave. Uh, you got the jitty, angular uh, guitar on Let Me Introduce You to the Family. Very new wave. Uh, the Man They Love to Hate has a great sound. This, you know, the synths are jittery. But also have like this little chip tune almost uh, sound to him, which is cool. And um, I don't know if this is the first time he does like the near spoken word, but uh, Hugh uh, mixing that in a little bit, which makes a nice... Uh, counterpoint to like the hectic stuff going on around them you know eye of the hurricane stuff pin up you got that pub rock sound and then the big single golden brown which tribute to both heroin and women the things that the band loves the most which <laughs> definitely makes sense um but it's a great song i uh, love the baroque you know 60s pop style with the sort of you know I don't know, sleazy lyrics, but uh, a lot of the double entendres are pretty clear uh, for that one. It's obvious what the song is about. Uh, so uh, a good album. I don't know. It didn't quite get to four stars for me. I don't know why. It could. I don't know. I still have it at 3.5 stars because it's just I didn't go back to it as much. So I don't know. I think it's a good album but not quite maybe it's missing some of like the classic giant bass and those like wild oscillating arpeggiating uh, synth and organ and stuff so i don't know 3.5 for la folie la folie is my number five as well coming out just nine months after the bizarre gospel according to the men in black and they return, I think, a little bit more to writing concise tunes again on this one. It's not like a return to their old sound. They kind of sort of return to that, but they've changed. They've returned changed men. This one was mixed by Tony Visconti uh, with explicit direction to mix every song as a potential single. And the album, I think, as a result, does have a very refined, almost sophisticated sound to it. Um, you know, Golden Brown was a big hit in the UK, which I think is very odd. I probably would not have considered that as a single. It's got like the Baroque harpsichord driven piece. Uh, to me, not uh, one of the catchier tunes or, or a standout in any way to me. I am shocked that it's one of their most well-known songs. Uh, but I like it. I think it's cool. I just would not have suspected that people would like it a lot um not much here blows me away but everything is pretty good and the cumulative effect of like having everything be pretty good i think i think it's actually better than the sum of its parts here is basically what i'm saying the man they love to hate i think is a really cool song tramp pinups how to find true love and happiness in the present day all very solid tunes but i, I, th I think 
well, Folly is a great way to close the record. I think it's an excellent uh, closing track. Um, my favorite song of this era is probably the non-album track, Strange Little Girl, which is really cool. Um, but on the whole, this record, I think it refines their sound. It strips away a lot of the energy of the early albums, but manages to stay interesting through having cool arrangements and uh, very charismatic vocals. It's well mixed, of course, by Visconti. So very solid. I like it a lot. Um, three and a half stars, a strong three and a half. It's my number four, 3.5, which means it's very good. I love the organ here. Not always, but here I do. Um, and yeah, I pretty much agree with everything that you guys said. Um, I think nonstop rules. It's got such a cool, catchy organ part and it's got great energy, just really unique arrangements. And, you know, I think at the best, the Stranglers, you know, they're not my favorite band, not even close to top 100, but they are pretty damn interesting most of the time, which is pretty cool. Just doesn't really strike a lot of chords with me. Um, but the keys on this album are great all over the place. Um, and I don't know if that has a lot to do with Visconti. I'm kind of guessing it is. Really going hard on the new wave here, which I dig. There's a cool darkness to it with like everybody loves you when you're dead. Tramp is really awesome. Again, great key work. Bass is hot. There's just like this really cool intelligentsia, synth pop kind of feel. Getting those disco vibes a little bit with introducing the family. Everyone is a good player on this album. You're really just, you know, never blown away, but everything's reined in. It's cool. Uh, there's a weird, like, pensiveness. There ain't nothing to it. Kind of like maybe the most post-punky song on the album. Pin Up is super strange and cool. Just missed my top ten, I think. Uh, it only takes two to tango. It has great vocal arrangements. Just great arrangements everywhere. It's a really just well-crafted album. One of their better well-crafted albums. You could maybe make an argument that this or um, Joe's least favorite album is, like, the most studio-esque album. And then Golden Brown, super cool. The harpsichord rules. Beautiful composition. Album finishes really strong. Yeah, I think it's just got really cool, unique stuff and a bit trend setting too, I'd say. Alrighty then. Getting close to the top here. I got No More Heroes is my number four. Uh, I like the sound of this one. It's definitely punkier, rawer, naughtier than the debut. Um <laughs> Bring on the new bios. I mean, we got to talk about this one because it is just outrageous. Uh, the line, I'll kiss your zone erogenous is mm, the chef's kiss on that one. Uh, and it gets much worse. I'm not even going to say it, but uh, some great lyrics on that one. Very descriptive. <laughs> um, but like, that's kind of like the raw, like mischievous, like mean but like sexual and like just like that's the punk spirit right like they just do not give a hell uh what they're saying feel like a wog bitching um dead ringer peasant in the big shitty like it's almost like a south park episode where they're just like let's just you know throw out as many of these like uh naughty little puns as we can and everything um, but I mean, I think it mostly works because the instrumentation is just so strong. No More Heroes is just so hard. Uh, that friggin' riff when he sings No More Heroes is just, mm, like you can feel it in your bones. It's great. Dead Ringer is just like all grime and dirt. And uh, that's really just the spirit of the whole album. Dagenheim Dave, that was a real poppy number. Uh, English Towns, very melodic, very pretty. Great keyboard sounds on that. Um, so, and there's less of like that gothic classical sound overall, but you know, they do a good job of, of kind of bridging the debut and, and some of the later stuff. But for the most part, this is just like, you know, not safe for work, like F you kind of punk action, which is cool. The only problem I think with this one is it ends with school ma'am or whatever, which I do not like at all. Um, six minutes plus almost seven minutes of just kind of trying too hard a little bit but overall i think it's a pretty solid album and it's just gonna just gonna kiss that four star mark for me uh so finally get to four stars here no worries with no more heroes from 1977 all right i will also be getting to four stars with my number four which is our old sculpture Another change in direction for them, a much warmer record than the very icy feline that came before it. Interesting then that it opens with a track called Ice Queen, 
uh, which is kind of like a misdirect for the record, I think. Um, also kind of cold and icy, like its predecessor. And then it just shifts gears after that. Finally, you know, they nail the choice of lead single for once with Skin Deep, which I think is great. Uh, really warm synths, great backing vocals. You've got like this tremolo guitar, far more lush than anything on Feline. Um, probably their best like pure pop song to date. Cornwell's vocals are tremendous, um, sounding better than ever. He almost sounds like Ian McCulloch a bit, um, which is interesting because uh, the producer of this record, Laurie Latham, had worked with uh, Echo and the Bunnymen. Um, Let Me Down Easy, I think, is another great pop song. And then No Mercy brings in the horns, which are great. Uh, Punch and Judy ups the ante even from there. Um, totally unlike anything else in their catalog, just a really joyful sounding record, I think great production it is their pop album but it's still i think on the right side of the pop tracks um you know some later albums get kind of into that soulless mainstream crap but this is more akin to like your bowie and your echo and your psychedelic furs and other bands that were having mainstream success around the time but still you know having some artistic integrity and i think it's just a, a really good 80s pop record uh, I think the songs are really strong. The production's good. So four stars for our old sculpture. All right. My number three, The Raven, 3.5. I love the content here, what they're singing about. Suicide rituals, really dark, heavy stuff, like genetic engineering. They're tackling it all. Uh, but again, it starts poorly like long ships just this weird throwaway little opener like totally pointless i sound like joe saying this here i feel like joe uh and i don't know what i like more like this kind of blend of like the old version with a little bit of like new wave or like the more weird experimental synth stuff but it's both very cool um the raven is a really cool song great guitar work killer synth lead like this is the coolest like guitar and synth album i think uh, bass is really awesome in uh, Dead Los Angeles. And there's a lot of attitude in the vocals and performances because I think just like the songs and the style are so like kind of like gothic and rich that you can kind of just like really sink your teeth into them as players. But again, the organ, when it shows up, is hurting it for me. Like, why, 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 why? Um, yeah, Ice, really cool com composition. Kind of a haunting presence here, like mixed with kind of poppy sensations, like on Sha Sha Go Go, very cool. Duchess is just a fantastic song, great spirit behind it. Yeah, I think this album just has tremendous album feel. It's not a concept album, but like just the overall vibe and sensations that they want, they nail. And it's perfectly titled The Raven, and you feel it. So 3.5 is my third favorite. Okay, my number three is going to be Black and White, 78. Four stars for this and i disagree with both of you i feel like this is actually the most creative most experimental other than maybe like the gospel according to men in black which is trash and unlistenable uh and i like the way they kind of explore they start off with tank which is a big raging punker uh, that bone rattling bass sound is so great big keys such a thick sound uh, really love that one and then they go to Nice and Sleazy, which completely, you know, that's that's what they're going for. That, that's their aesthetic they were doing on No More Heroes. That immature FU attitude really works for them. Uh, but then they, I think they start to branch out. You got uh, the brooding, mysterious outside Tokyo with a really cool bass tone. Uh, hey, Rise of the Robots, a little speedy, uh, punk but uh, they throw some sax in there, which is cool. Um, you know, more of the, the keys. I think the keys are like kind of connective tissue uh, of all their first you know, seven or eight albums. Uh, Greenfield's just doing some cool stuff there. Curfew is in like eight, seven time. Uh, very weird and moody. But that's a great uh, rough and tumble sound. And then they get like really experimental uh, with like uh, Threaten, Do You Wanna, Death and Night and Blood. Yukio is really interesting. In the Shadows, kind of just like weird, not trying to be poppy or melodic, just trying to be you know, weird and experimental, which is pretty cool. I do think it kind of ends on a 
eh, no, with enough time, the second side, the black side, as it were, not quite as melodic, not quite as poppy. Uh, they get away from like the punk and the pop and the melodicism a little bit too much, but uh, I do think it is interesting and unique sounding. And all the playing is great. I think Hugh sounds great. I think the band sounds great. The production is good. And uh, just a solid, interesting album from them. So four stars for Black and White. All right. My number three is Radis Norvegicus, the debut from 1977. They sometimes call this album four, but apparently they just put the four on the cover just strictly to confuse people, which is just kind of indicative of their humor. I think it's pretty funny. Uh, recorded in one week, it focuses on what the band's live set was at the time. They're just kind of blasting through stuff here. It's punky, it's energetic, but they have a musical sophistication not shared by many punk bands. Um, Dave Green, Greenfield's keys really give the band a unique sound. I love his keys on the opener sometimes. Um, there's that great dueling guitar solo on Goodbye to Lose, which is great. And, you know, they're able to slow things down on a track like Princess of the Street. Uh, Hugh Cornwell's vocals sound like they're almost like going in slow motion on that track. It's so cool. There's also a great guitar solo on that one as well. Jean-Jacques Burnell's bass is just so good. He's such a great bass player. I love the bass line on Hanging Around. Great groove on the song Peaches. It's just a very cool album. It fits into the punk genre enough to be called punk, but it feels different than a lot of the other punk at the time. It feels less like politics and anger and more the feeling that they're just like a bunch of weird outcasts um, and they're just like blasting through these weird songs. I don't know. It's dirty. It's grimy. It's a little gothic, a little creepy, but it's also funny and not overly serious, which is why I think it works so well. So very good record. Four stars for Radis Norvegicus. All right. My number two, which I think is Jason's number one. I've got Gospel According to Men in Black. 3.5 i think it's really good i'm surprised joe doesn't like it with like the whole like aliens invading and the government like covering it up like he loves all that comic book kind of stuff and i think it's a cool idea and i think they pull it off really well um instrumental opener probably didn't do joe any favors um you know but it kind of struggles with openers um their albums really struggle to hit you right off the bat except the really good ones just Like Nothing on Earth has some really hot, scorching bass, and the synth parts are so cool. I love just how strange they're being with the content and their behavior. It's so ahead of its time, and it totally buys into the concept. And even some of like the synth sounds and everything are like pretty, pretty unique to this time. Um, you know, it seems like the aliens have gotten a hold of the band members and possessed them into using their own language through the song. And like, like on... Um, just like nothing on earth how he like vomits the word earth he's like Bleh. it's so cool the biblical themes tie in are cool cosmic sounds everywhere even the composition of second coming uh simple and weird is what i like from this band and then you get waiting for the men in black very cool there's like a heaviness to it almost key touches everywhere are so great and the drums are actually really fierce on this album it feels like you're being invaded and like something sinister is happening it's very cool uh, turn the centuries, great bass, mystical keys, powerful drums, dark and ominous. Then you get the perkier two sunspots, getting into like kind of geek pop there. So it gives it a lot of variety. You know, the songs on their own probably won't stand out, but the album experience is just really good. Even Thrown Away is like really catchy. Hello to Our Men, good closer. Almost four stars and almost my number one, but putting a number two. Okay. Uh, my number two is going to be The Raven, and I think this might be their coolest sounding album. It's just really unique, really interesting. I like long ships. I like the instrumentals. I like the opener on most of these albums. I think they're all solid long ships, just really cool, icy synths, really set the mood uh, for like the mysterious gothic uh contents within which you kind of get right off from the album cover which is awesome love that big old raven on there and the track the raven it's fantastic love the buzzing synth bed underneath slower moody but there's a really cool rolling guitar line uh from hugh cornwell here which is pretty sick and um 
for the most part, the keys, Dave Greenfield, fantastic work. He's really, you know, the heart and soul of the band. He controls the sound. Dead Los Angeles has this choppy, robotic vibe, which is cool. Double basses on this, no guitars, which is interesting. I like that. Mixing things up a little bit. Really like ice. The synth sounds are so cool. Sounds like a mighty MIDI controller kind of thing. Uh, Space Invaders or Commodore 64, just like really unique, interesting. Uh, haven't heard anything close to that sound, I think, on any other album or band that we've done yet. So that's cool. Get a little uh, Baroqueness on Baroque Bordello. Don't Bring Harry uh, has a little like um, classic zombies or left bank sound to it, which is cool. Shasha Agogo is really fun. Love Jean Jacques' bass line there. Powerful and danceable, I think, at the same time. Nuclear Device, another one with a nice bouncy bass, upbeat keys, but full of like weird stops and starts and odd lines about, um, I don't even know exactly what they're singing about on this album, but it's weird and I like it. And of course you got Duchess, which is this fantastic uh, pop sound a little 80s uh, mixed with Baroqueness, which is cool, very unique, and a great um, running, just like driving bass line, which is cool. Uh, Men in Black, terrible, really sabotages the whole album for me. Really don't like the alien voices. Can't believe they made an entire concept album around that song. Like, why couldn't they do like Nice and Sleazy or Bring On the New Miles? I'll take a concept album about bring on the new miles way more than i want a concept album about uh men in black and genetics is cool it's not like a great song but a lot of cool ideas on there cool instrumental chops getting shown off there so it's cool great baseline of course those are the things that keep me coming back uh for the most part to these albums so Four stars for The Raven, my number two. All right. My number two is The Feline, or sorry, just Feline. I was listening to this originally in the car, and I was driving around, and I was like, oh, this is where things take a downturn. This isn't going to be that great. And then I got home and didn't finish it, so I started it over the next day. And upon subsequent listens, I uh, just really fell in love with it and uh, thought it was really cool, unique, interesting and as far as I can tell, looking at like other people's lists on our Discord and how it's ra rated at places online, I don't think Joe's alone in thinking it's not one of their better records. But man, I just I thought it was so cool. Get a lot more acoustic guitar and electronic drums on this, which you don't really get anywhere else, um, especially the acoustics in their discography, um, at least not to this extent. You know, in just a couple of records, they had dramatically evolved their sound uh, from where they started. It's got a very cool European vibe to it. Like the cat on the cover, you've got like this confidence and coolness on display here. You know, they let the songs develop a lot more slowly. There's a lot more repetition. And usually I'm not a huge fan when songs are super repetitive, but it's done to great effect here. They introduce elements and um, have these like subtle dynamic shifts within the songs that work so well. It's a small world, super cool song, Ships That Pass in the Night. Uh, I think both of those tracks just so catchy, just get stuck in in my brain so much space in these mixes too which is rare for a stranglers record even compared to la folie bef um, before it um they're really boiling the arrangements down to the bare essentials on this record and i think it works um it makes for a very different album experience from anything else they've got it's very minimalist almost i love the almost spanish guitar on european female like who knew the stranglers had that in them just a total left turn I love the female vocals on Paradise, which are super cool. Something you could not even imagine them doing prior to this record. The synths on All Roads Lead to Rome are great. I can see why it might not be for some, but I think it's just a really cool hyper stylized um, version of their sound and it works really well. I think it's great. Four and a half stars. All right. My favorite Stranglers album is the debut, Radis Norvegicus. Sometimes is awesome. Cromwell has so much umph and believability and poise and confidence and charisma. 
And I like what Jason said, where it's like they are a way more interesting and talented and creative version of a punk band who's not just like upset, anti-establishment. Like they're weirdos and they're strange and it comes out in the playing and the, you know, composition and the atmosphere. It's so cool. Really cool instrumentation, almost psychedelic, even like in the solo on the title track, bass setting the tone early. You know, you're going to get that for the rest of the discography. It's, you know not the runaway hall of fame part of this band but it's probably the mvp it's the un, it's the unsung hero that gets a lot of praise love the scraping guitars on goodbye to loose london lady is super cool and i really love the bass work however this one has a killer lead on it cool art house style like intelligentsia punk very cool the ah uh, ah uh, on london lady and the subsequent little solos is so cool like you're not getting like the sex pistols aren't going to do that sort of stuff Vocals on Princess of the Streets, super cool. And that guitar lead, closest they get to just crying out the blues, very awesome. Lots of variety. You get so much influence and style here. Don't even mind the organ sprayed throughout. Peaches, you get kind of like that reggae flair. It's an all-star cast of styles, which are really unique. Like there's so many things, but do it so, you know, uniquely that it is just themselves it reminds me kind of the damn dynamic of some of those early x albums where it's like oh it says so many things but it can only be x using this these ingredients in their recipe it's just them it's a little punk it's a little new wave it's a little pub rock it's a little a lot of things a little gothic it's a little moody it's a little energetic a little spunky a little rock and roll medley at the end shows off their talent it's great four stars it's my number one Yep, my number one too. Um, I just think this is so cool, so unique sounding. It's like the doors had sex with the sex pistols or something, like this weird intersection of like Ray Manzarek's keyboards and like this punky bratty vibe. And I just think it's so cool. They're all such good players, which really helps. Like it's not the sex pistols and just like clamoring away like these guys are like masters already at their instruments dave greenfield's uh synths and organs and all those huge arpeggios are just so cool i uh, really fell in love with this album first time i heard it and um, they just bring in so many styles like i asked myself is like is this punk like it, it doesn't sound like it but it has like the attitude of it so it works on so many ways um the Opener sometimes is just a total blast. London Lady has like this UK bar band, Elvis Costello sound, pub rock, uh, but with a really great guitar solo. And, the, and that's one thing I miss on the later albums. Like Cornwell's really just like letting loose on this thing. And he, he kind of doesn't do that on the other albums. Like this is, you know, you, you get some of that like classic 70s guitar tones and, and solos on this that kind of disappear on the rest of their albums but um you know prince of the streets great really that's where i noticed like the ray manzarek keyboard sound organ sound uh, but let's get some nice delicate guitar like they do the fast punk thing and then they rein it in for like this really nice classical sounding uh guitar stuff and they do gothic um on hanging around which is great They'll do upbeat swing, get a grip on yourself. They'll be like lewd and lascivious on peaches and uglies, bratty, punky stuff. And then they kind of bring it all together. I'm down in the sewer, which I think is just phenomenal. Um, really just, it's like punk prog. Like they're just showing off, shredding, doing all these interesting uh, guitar figures, all these great uh, extended instrumental passages cool keys cool bass great drums and it just kind of morphs into these different uh flavors fantastic i have this one at four and a half stars it's close to five for me but um not quite at five four and a half it's very it's radis norvegic did i even say the title radis norvegicus is my number one from the stranglers I want to strangle Jason with his number one. So I, want to I hate to break up the trifecta with such a weird record, but my number one is the gospel according to the men in black from 1981 self-produced. 
a concept album about alien visitation and how that relates to well-known Bible stories. It's the result of the band experimenting with heroin. It is uh, Hugh Cornwell's favorite Stranglers record. It opens with an odd instrumental with these like pitched alien cackles, which is really strange. Almost Rundgren-esque in its weirdness. Reminds me of something like Dogfight Giggle from A Wizard of True Star. Just Like Nothing on Earth is great. The spoken word verses, the gurgling synths, the bizarre way he says, Ugh. Um, the odd guitar lines. Should not work at all, but it's so memorable. It's so fun. I love the sci-fi angle. It's almost a little like B-52's influence, I think, with the kind of like retro futuristic thing that they're doing. I really love it. Um, the songs are extremely hooky without being super melodic, uh, which is an interesting thing. It's, it, it is kind of like in that B-52's vein where you have a hook like Rock Lobster, which is so memorable, but not really like a true melody. It's just like these little things that get stuck in your in your ear. Um, and I just think the whole thing is incredibly cohesive, um, but still with really good variety. And I think it's very accessible for being as strange as it is. I love a record that can get this weird and still be this much fun and this enjoyable. Um, Thrown Away, the lead single sung by Burnell is, is a really cool track. Gives like this very cool detached vocal performance on it. I think it's a really weird and arty record, but I think it's extremely interesting, very cool, kind of silly. And, and maybe that's what I like the most about it. There's just like this silly carefreeness. They're just having fun. They're on heroin and having a blast in the studio. And it's just, I don't know, it's it's bizarre. I'll give you that. But I, I just I just found it so enjoyable, so interesting. Uh, four and a half stars for the gospel, according to the men in black. Ooh, yeah, second time we had a Depeche Mode situation. I think there was another time Joe and I had that happen. On a small discography, I think. Uh, it Kate Bush, I believe. Any final thoughts on the Stranglers, guys? Cool, weird, liked them a lot, didn't love them. Very memorable playing. I don't know about memorable songs. Like, I, well, I don't know. Like, I like a lot of these songs, but these albums, like, I don't know, they kind of got, like, bunched together, and I couldn't, like, pull them out, and, like, I don't know, it all kind of ran together a little bit too much for me, but uh, love that debut, anyway. Yeah, I would kind of agree. I think they're a cooler band than they are a great band, and they have their moments, and, you know, if I came across um, some of their records out in the wild, I'd probably pick them up. But uh, I think the length of their discography hurts it, and some of the inconsistencies, and genericness of some of the later stuff also weighed down the week but uh, i think their classic era is very strong uh, let us know what you think of our list down in the comments drop your own ranking down there as well don't forget to hit the like button subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so yet and remember you can also uh, support us on patreon if you're interested in doing so you can vote on some of the artists we cover you can join our discord um, it's a cool community that's growing there so check that out uh, we also have merch available uh, you can find that link in the video description as well. Our website, all kinds of links, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all in the video description. Follow them all. Thanks for watching, and we will see you tomorrow for our top 10 Stranglers songs.